Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Eloise Kofer Family Living Lecture. I'm Carolyn Dunn. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the Department of Agricultural and Human Sciences, we are proud to present tonight's program from the Dinah Gore Teaching and Research Kitchens at NC State. 2020 has been a year like no other. We hope you and your family are healthy and safe. We know that so many families are struggling with health and or economic issues. Please know our thoughts are with you. In this season of celebrations, we are pleased you are here with us tonight for this very special event. Before I introduce Chef Chidi Kumar, who we are so excited to have with us here tonight, let me tell you a bit about Dr. Eloise Kofer, whose generous gift made this evening possible. Dr. Kofer left many legacies, one of which, of course, is this lecture series. She was a department head, state program leader, and one of the first women full professors at NC State. When she learned that she and other women professors made less than their male counterparts across campus, she worked to gain pay equity for all women all across campus. She was instrumental at bringing cutting edge programming to support limited resource families to North Carolina, and this federal funding we still enjoy today. She was also a leader during the civil rights era and worked to build one strong extension system to serve all families. An avid cook and nutrition profession, professional, I am sure she would have loved tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce our 2020 Eloise Kofer lecturer, Chef Chidi Kumar. Chidi is not a stranger to our department, having worked with us many years ago until she left to follow her culinary passions. She is the chef owner for the celebrated restaurant Garland in downtown Raleigh. She is a James Beard Best Chef Southeast finalist, which are the Oscars for the food world. As you will soon see, her Indian heritage merged with her time in New York City and love for local Southern ingredients makes for unique and delicious food. I know I have my New Year's Day menu. If you have questions, please be sure to type them in the chat box. Chidi will answer questions at the end of tonight's presentation. We are so honored that she is with us tonight to share her story. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Chidi Kumar. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for joining back at home. Get started here. Um, as you just heard, I did work here at NC State. Uh, that was a long time ago. I've lived in Raleigh for a couple of decades. Um, this was the first place that I chose uh, to call home. I'm originally from India. Um, my family was there when you know I was a baby up until the age of eight and a half. And the whole time that we were living in India, our family dreamed of moving to the US. My parents had lived here for a few years and then had to go back and they talked about um, the, the cleanliness and the opportunity and the freedom that was, uh, you know, enjoyed by everybody who lived here. So I spent a great deal of my childhood fantasizing about America and uh, all of the delicious food that was here and, you know, the clean wide streets and the air conditioning and, you know, all of the little comforts that we take for granted. Um, we finally uh, moved to America. My dad got a job, uh, but it was in the Bronx. And we landed, and I was so disappointed. Um, I was shocked to see this sort of concrete urban environment, one like I had never experienced before. And it was um, a pretty, you know, tough, cold place for an uh, eight-year-old girl who was like really self-conscious about her accent, about the way she looked, and you know, the weird food that my mom cooked. Um, and as, as we kind of settled into life in New York, I um, made friends with other kids who all also happened to be immigrants or, you know, first generation um, kids of immigrants. And one thing that we all found in common was that we each had our own secretive weird refrigerator with all these weird smelling things that, my, uh, that our moms used to cook. And we started kind of having lunch with each other in our apartments and we would kind of share um, you know, kimchi from my Korean friend and 
uh, Mama Liga for my Romanian friend and all of the amazing dishes that my Greek, mom, Greek friend's mom used to make. Um, and I started to see that people really connect uh, with food and there's an identity that we forge with our families as, um, as kids. Uh, I think food is such a, a teller of a story of a family, of a place, and also the telling of the story of people that move from one place to another in search of a better life. Um, the way we uh, transform what we grew up eating into what we, um, you know, what feels relevant to us now is also the story of our life. Um, so, you know, when, when we were in India, um, I'm sorry, when we were in the Bronx, my mom worked full time and I ended up being sort of the kid that helped her in the kitchen. Um, I always really liked to cook and I'd uh, grown up when, uh, when we were in India, was with my grandmother lived with us and I always kind of like snuck around and, you know, spied on her and watched her and she started letting me help. And my mom saw that I might, you know, be a, a, a reliable helper for her. So I, I never really thought of food at that point as a creative vehicle. It was just, you know, helping my mom and doing the chores that she uh, put on me. And my creative uh, creativity was not really something that we focused on. It wasn't, um, you know, as, as kids of, of immigrants, especially Indian immigrants, uh, we're you know, supposed to do good in school, get good grades, uh, be good at math and science, but and not worry about all of, all of the other stuff. But um, so it wasn't until much later that I started to see food as this vehicle for you know expressing uh, different ideas and making connections between cultures and places. Um, that kind of happened after I moved to Raleigh. So I visited Raleigh um, as part of a spring break trip. Um, instead of going to Daytona Beach, um, my friend and I came to Raleigh and I felt this sense of uh, connection here. There was a, a, a play, uh, like a, a sense of community, a sense of wonder and possibility. It felt really easy to live here, but uh, looking back, I think, it was the way um, the buildings were kind of modernist and where we grew up in, in, in India is a city called Chandigarh, which is a pretty new city. It was built in the 50s and I always thought it was uh, designed by this French architect, uh, French modernist architect named Le Corbusier, but uh, about three years ago, a friend of mine who's an architect told me that the original architect for the, my city in India, Chandigarh, uh, was a Polish immigrant who actually lived in Raleigh and was the head of uh, the architecture department here at NC State. And he had laid the plans for Chandigarh before he was killed in a plane crash on his way back to Raleigh from Chandigarh. So that kind of really blew my mind and it, it kind of um, exemplified and made concrete the connection that I felt to this place um, here in North Carolina. And when, you know, I decided to live here for just a couple of years, uh, cut to two decades later, um, it was going to the farmer's market that really kind of uh, made me feel inspired and uh, excited to be here. I saw all of these connections between uh, the way we cooked in India and here. We had this gap in New York where we were just kind of, you know, removed from the seasons and nature and we were just kind of getting through life. But here in Raleigh, um, I found purple top turnips and mustard greens and corn and eggplant and okra. And these are all the things that I grew up eating and that my mom always was cooking. Um, and then I cut a little deeper and realized that there was so many ethnic um, diversity, so much ethnic diversity here. And I could find almost any ingredient from India or Asia if I just looked hard enough and you know got, got in the car and drove 10 minutes and I could you know, lo and behold, I could have a pantry that, you know, would allow me to make the transition from a home cook to opening a restaurant. And um, that's, you know, sort of where that journey started was to uh, go to the market, go to the Indian store, go to the Chinese market, come home and experiment with recipes, invite some friends over and, you know, enjoy uh, me experimenting on them basically. Um, and one of my fondest memories was, uh, Every New Year's, I started inviting about 25 people to my apartment, and I would make an Indianish version of black-eyed peas and collards and rice. Um, I'd really loved this tradition uh, called luck and money because these were dishes that were really kind of familiar to me already. My mom had made black-eyed peas growing up uh, in a dish called rangi, which is a Punjabi dish, and 
Uh, we grew up eating sag, and I'm sure a lot of you have ordered sag um, at Indian restaurants, but it's traditionally made with mustard greens. Um, I did not grow up eating collards, but I really, you know, have grown to love them. One, because I find them to be so much easier to clean than mustard greens, and I'm inherently a very lazy person. So um, I love this recipe with collards, but you can certainly substitute with any greens that you find at the market. Um, so I thought that it would be fun to talk about these two recipes as we finally say goodbye to 2020, good riddance. Um, and we can just, uh, you know, uh, think about these interesting, more uh, pungent or, or bright flavors uh, to pair with ingredients that you're already familiar with. So instead of using a ham hock for seasoning, we're going to use aromatics like onions and ginger and garlic and coriander and a little bit of carrots for sweetness. And um, in the black eyed pea recipe, you'll see a little bit of cumin seed. Um, if you can't find an ingredient, and these recipes are in your email, uh, in your inbox, so check them out. Um, if you're intimidated by using something or you just can't find something, don't worry. Just, you know, substitute. The point is that um, I just want people to feel a little bit more uh, comfortable working with spices and learning how to, you know, use fresh spices to grind them uh, as you're cooking um, and to buy whole seeds and, you know, uh, just relax about it a little bit. So um, why don't we get started with uh, the collards. And if you've never worked with collards before, um, you will find that they are, you know, really easy to work with. They're easy to clean. Like I said earlier, they're flat. So I would just plunge them in a sink full of cold water and, you know, shake them around, take them out, and you don't have to worry about drying them too much because the um, moisture on the leaf will actually help you uh, cook uh, the greens a little bit faster. If you're a person who likes to cook in an Instant Pot, um, I love this recipe in the Instant Pot with not very much liquid. Um, and they're, they're going to come out a little bit differently. This is a stir fry sort of dish and it uh, retains a lot of bright green texture. Um, in the Instant Pot, they're going to be a little bit, you know, more stewed, but they're really delicious because they cook in their own juices and really intensifies that flavor. Um, so if you're working with collards, um, normally, you know, you might find them much bigger. These are really tender, lovely baby collards. Uh, the bigger ones have a thicker uh, stalk, and all you have to do is just rip the, the, um, the thick part off, and it'll kind of break right where it's tender. It's kind of like asparagus, you know, it kind of tells you where you want to go. You can also just use a knife and cut the rib out, and I would save these. Uh, they make a great pickle. And um, you can also just chop them real fine and add them to this recipe. If you're using mustard greens, even more so because those stems are a lot more tender. But um, so I, I try not to throw things away. And in order to get a really uh, even fine cut, I just stack the leaves up, you know, do like three or four at a time, fold them over, and then roll them like a cigar. Real simple. And then just take your knife and cut them into thin ribbons. If you don't want really long pieces or if your collards are really big, just cut along the middle there, stack them up again, and then you'll have smaller pieces. But whatever floats your boat. If you have really small tender turnip or mustard greens, you can just tear them or get your kid to tear them for you. And there you have it. So you'll have a nice a uh, big bowl full of greens. And one thing to note is greens do cook down quite a bit. So you might start with a really giant bowl of greens and wonder how it's all going to fit in the pot. Don't worry, just cram them in there and you'll see in the, um, in the recipe that uh, you can fold the hot uh, aromatics over and the greens will just kind of cook down. So um, we're going to go ahead and re uh, watch the rest of the recipe and you'll learn how to make this dish. So to properly julienne an onion, you want to cut it um, in half from pole to pole, north to south. Uh, leave the little root end in there so it'll stay together while you're cutting it. And just start from the side, tilt your knife a little bit, and just go that way. And when I get to the center is when I take that little root out. And then flip it over, 
and finish it up. And in addition to this dish that you may be surprised by is ginger. I think ginger and greens are such a natural combination to julienne it or to have a nice fine mince. You just want to cut some thin slices and again you're stacking them up and you make little matchsticks and then you stack up the matchsticks, get them together and then cut little small mints and there you have it very easy and the last ingredient that you may not be familiar with is coriander um, coriander seed is just I, I can't live without it it's got a beautiful citrusy kind of orange peel note uh, when it's raw, it has one sort of flavor profile. When you cook it, it's got another flavor profile. It's crucial in pickle brines um, as a whole seed. But once you grind it and you bloom it in oil, it releases this sort of earthiness. And it's such a natural combination with ginger, onion, and garlic, which is sort of the basis of a lot of um, Indian aromatics. And I would encourage you to buy whole seed spices, if at all possible. And I think uh, cumin and coriander are showing up a lot more in just regular supermarkets. So um, if you buy the whole seed, it'll last you months. If you buy the, the ground coriander, uh, it may already be dead by the time you get it home. So I like to keep whole seed spices on hand and then grind them in small quantities as I need and keep a few um, pinches uh, on your, next to your stove if you are uh, cooking with those spices. So I have a coffee uh, grinder that's dedicated to spices. If you don't, don't worry, but I just would encourage you if you're starting to think about cooking with spices to make the $20 investment and get just a cheap coffee grinder and I'll show you how fast this goes. And it smells incredible and that's about all there is to it. If you have a mortar and pestle, you can do that in a mortar and pestle and if you don't, just even laying out a few seeds on the cutting board and use the bottom of a heavy skillet. And if they're not perfectly ground, don't worry. I really like getting a little bite of whole seed spices in my food, and I think you will too. So now we can get started with our recipe. Put in a couple of tablespoons of olive oil, and as you can see, my wok is pretty hot. You can use a, a wide, deep skillet if you don't have a wok, but this kind of um, makes everything go a lot faster. And we're going to start with our onion, a little salt, and we're not looking for caramelization, just a little bit of translucency. And along with the onion, I'm going to go ahead and add my ginger. I'm going to push everything to the side a little and add my coriander. I'm going to go ahead and add my garlic. Okay, so we've got just a little bit of color on these onions. And I'm going to say that we're going to, we're ready for our greens. And now this looks like a lot of greens, and it is. But it's going to cook down quite a bit. And you want to put this in your pan or pot in stages. And what I do is kind of like fold the hot onions on top of the collards. And that wilts them down and gives you a little bit more space in your pan for your next batch. You can put a lid on this if you don't want to turn, if you don't have tongs, it's fine. Okay, you can add a few more. One more little turn. We add a little bit more salt. And I'm going to put some pepper flakes in here. You can use dried chilies if you want, or break them open and use the flakes on the inside. You can skip the pepper altogether if you don't like it spicy. 
I'm going to add a little beer. Um, you can use hard cider or even white wine. But I like the beer with these greens and just not even a half a beer, the rest for yourself. Cooked share. And I have a little chicken stock. If you want to keep this vegan, you can certainly just use vegetable stock or mushroom stock. And probably won't even, yeah, we'll just use, this is one cup. And a little bit of soy sauce just for umami. And that's about it for this phase. You can cover it if you'd like, or you can leave it uncovered if you're going to be around. Um, and it doesn't, like, we're not cooking this for two hours or anything. This is going to be a pretty quick cook, and especially these baby collards are already so tender, they don't need that much time. So I've got my collards on low. I put a lid on there just to keep all the juices in the dish. So my pan is super hot. My greens are pretty much done. I'm going to take the lid off. And that's turned down on low. And I'm going to add the rest of the olive oil to this pan. I'm going to give it one more layer of coriander. You just throw that in there. And within seconds, you know, it's sizzling and dancing. It smells delicious. Add um, some carrots. This is about three carrots. I've done this with apples at the end, and it's really delicious. Whatever you have on hand, the idea is that we're going to balance a little bit of bitterness from the greens with something sweet. I'm going to season these with a little salt. Now add a little apple cider vinegar. You can use rice vinegar if you'd like. And a little bit of honey to boost the sweetness. And we're just kind of cooking the carrots a little bit so they retain a, a, their texture. And we're going to pour that whole thing right into the greens and toss it around. Beautiful color. We are done. And just to boost the ginger flavor a little bit, add a little um, finely uh, grated ginger. You can do this on a microplane. And there you have it. Pretty wintry collards. So you can see how easy that recipe is. Um, and it's really fast. It's a lot um, faster than stewing it all day, which of course is uh, a delicious way to do it. but. Um, hopefully you'll try it out and enjoy it. Um, so no uh, luck and money is complete without the luck, and God knows we need that this year. So we're going to talk about uh, field peas, and these are black-eyed peas, which are a category. Um, sorry, field peas are the category, and black-eyed peas are part of that category. Um, we started with dried peas, but if you were smart enough to put up some fresh field peas from the summer, um, in your freezer, uh, just keep in mind that it'll go a lot faster um, when you're cooking them on the, on the first step of the recipe. Uh, and you, of course, don't have to soak um, fresh peas. Uh, for New Year's, you might be able to, might be able to find fresh black-eyed peas in the freezer section, but please try not to use the canned um, kind. They really just don't have the same taste or texture. Um, so with dried peas, you want to always, you know, soak them overnight um, is preferable at least six hours. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have plenty of water. You don't need to measure the water, just, you know, they're going to grow quite a bit. So go ahead and put enough water to cover them by three to four inches. And these are the same peas that have been soaking for the last eight hours. And you'll see how much they grew. So it's the same volume, three quarters of a pound and they swell up. And what you're doing is basically uh, getting them primed for cooking. If you don't soak them, the heat will just kind of cook the outside and the inside will kind of never get soft um, and tender. Uh, you can do the stewing part, um, the first part of the recipe, cooking with aromatics. You can do that in the slow cooker. And in fact, that's, my, that's how my mom used to make uh, dried beans. We had uh, you know, beans or lentils 
very, very often in my house. I did not uh, appreciate that very much when I was a kid, but um, she would always, you know, after dinner, so put, put some peas in a uh, bowl, soak them. In the morning, she'd get them in the, um, in the stock pot, in the slow cooker, and then I would come home and finish and make the rice. And making rice was always my job. Um, I really resented it, but I'm so thankful for it now because I realized that people are really intimidated by cooking rice. Um, so I thought um, I would share some techniques on cooking, uh, just basic, you know, varieties of white rice. And uh, again, you'll find that recipe in your email as well. Um, in, this re uh, in this recipe, I use jasmine rice because I really love the fragrance of it with these pretty spices um, and aromatics. Uh, of course, basmati would be an amazing uh, accompaniment, but I think jasmine is my, my Good quality jasmine is a little bit easier to find. I think that the um, the regular bag variety in the grocery store of basmati is just uh, kind of a confidence buster because it never comes out quite right. Um, so one thing to always remember about rice is that you should wash it. Um, some rices you should soak uh, if you want them to be sort of separate. So sticky rice, not necessarily um, something that you need to soak because you're looking for the starches to help you uh, bind the grains together, but for long grain wild rice, you want uh, long grain uh, white rice, you want all the grains to be separate and have integrity. So, washing the rice until it runs clear um, and soaking it if it calls for it, like basmati really likes to be soaked for about 30 minutes. And you'll see um, in the recipe that uh, you want to do that three times at least until the water runs clear. Um, beans and rice are something that you know people enjoy uh, the world over. I think it's a staple for so many cultures and uh, traditions. I think people enjoy it in India and obviously um, in the South. But um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the journey of those kind of uh, combinations that came from India and West Africa. You know, had a lot of connection over the last you know 500 years. We shared a lot in our um, colonial history with the British. Um, there were a lot of uh, migrant servants that went from India to Africa. And then obviously we know about the, um, the forced migration of West African um, uh, black people to the South and the impact that that has had on Southern food, uh, you know, I don't think we can talk enough about it. So I, I see this connection in the Caribbean as well, which is, you know, a part of that journey um, of eating rice and peas together in Puerto Rico, in South America, in the South, in New Orleans, which really kind of uh, brings a lot of those traditions together. And so today, you know, on the um, Black Eyed Pea recipe, yes, our spices our uh, Punjabi, we're using uh, cumin and coriander, but I added some celery and carrots to mirror the mirepoix that, um, or the holy trinity that's used in, in Cajun cooking because we are kind of making a hop and john here. Um, so uh, one thing about the cumin, you'll see that we are using whole cumin seeds and uh, that might be something that you've not done before. You might have only bought, you know, ground cumin powder. Um, I would urge you to really try to find some whole cumin seeds because with this you can get the powder and you can also, um, you know, transform this in so many different ways. Um, when you toast it whole in a dry skillet, it starts to crackle and it um, gives you this really lovely smoky, depth of flavor that you can grind. And if you put a pinch of that in your pico de gallo, you'll never not do that again. Um, most ground spices, most uh, whole seed spices really need some heat to wake up the, uh, the oils that are lying dormant inside. So in this recipe, we have whole cumin seeds that we put into hot oil and it starts to crackle and it seasons the oil. And it also ends up like marrying all of the flavors of your base aromatics, which are, um, again, onions, ginger, garlic, um, again, the addition of uh, celery and carrot. And I'm using uh, green cayenne, fresh green cayenne pepper in this recipe. This is in season in North Carolina, the farmer's market, several um, of the farmers at the farmer's market in, at, um, you know, down the street on, uh, off South Saunders, uh, grow, this grow this pepper. It's a green cayenne pepper. It looks hot, but it's really not as hot as, as a serrano or a Thai chili. And I really love the flavor of this because 
Um, it lends a little bit of heat, a quick attack, and then it goes away. And I think the thing that people um, find scary or objectionable about hot peppers is that the heat kind of builds and builds, and you're just like wondering when it's ever going to be over. Um, this pepper doesn't do that. Um, they carry this pepper year-round at uh, Indian markets such as Patel Brothers and Kerry. Um, and if you can't find it, you can substitute Serrano, but I would caution you to use a lot less. I mean, uh, I grew up eating spicy food, but I find Serrano's to be really hot. Of course, you can use jalapenos. I would maybe use more jalapeno than uh, the recipe calls for for this pepper because generally they're pretty mild. But taste a little bit and, um, you know, judge for yourself. And feel free to uh, experiment with the quantities that we're presenting in the recipe. Um, peas, rice. Uh, we're going to top everything off with some, um, some yogurt uh, or sour cream. Uh, this dish actually has a Punjabi name, which I think I mentioned earlier, called rongi. Um, and, you know, when I first had um, my first black-eyed pea uh, at a vegetable, uh, on a vegetable plate at a meat and three, that, I think that was when I realized that I belonged in the South because it was so familiar to me. Uh, not quite the same flavors, but... Um, it was it was pretty amazing to see that up on the on the whiteboard at at Watkins Grill in uh, in Raleigh down on Wake Forest Road. Um, so we're gonna uh, watch uh, what we do once these peas are soaked. They're gonna cook uh, kind of plain, and then we're gonna finish them uh, with our sizzling of aromatics. And that is a technique called tharka. And I um, you know maybe Google that uh, T A R K A. Sometimes it's called a chunk. And um, it's a technique that can be used with all kinds of flavors. And it, I think it gives you the confidence to know that you can take something really bland and not worry about it. And at the very last minute, in the last five minutes of that recipe, you can add a, a big, bright, bold flavor of, um, you know, bloomed spices and oil with onions and garlic or not. It doesn't even matter. I think the addition of that oil to the end of a recipe really makes you feel like, you know, you, can't, you kind of can't mess it up too much. You can always fix it at the very end. So let's see how it's done. Go ahead and put your soaked peas in a nice big pot and cover it with a couple of inches of water. So peas with about that much water above. And we're just going to add some raw chopped onion and a little bit of ginger. And you can do whatever you, whatever you like. You can add thyme. You can add some garlic in here if you'd like. You can even add a little powdered turmeric. That's about all there is to it. You can do this in a crock pot. Um, you know, set it in the morning, and by the time you get home from work, they're nice and cooked. You can do it in an instant pot. A pressure cooker really reduces the cooking time. I'm going to move this over. So and that's on low. I'm going to get my pan heated. And in the meantime, you'll remember that we didn't season our peas with salt at all at this point. Um, that was awkward. And they're going to need a good amount of seasoning. And you can see that there is just enough liquid to sort of cover them. Um, if for some reason your water boils out before your peas are tender, you can add a little bit more water. There's really no stress about this. And just check them. A pinch more salt and now we're going to finish them up with another layer of ar aromatics. This is, they're delicious but they're really plain. So why not give them the boost that we can. So we got our pan heated up here. Try to not use a nonstick, just a stainless pan or even a cast iron would be fine. I'm using olive oil. Um, this is great with ghee, which is uh, clarified butter. I don't have any on hand, so I'm just going to use a little butter. You can just use all olive oil or canola or any combination of a good, nicely flavored oil. We want to get our fat pretty hot. Okay, so our got a nice hot pan with uh, olive oil and butter, and we're going to add some whole cumin seeds. And now we're going to add our onions. 
we're going to add celery and a little carrot. And we're going to season this with a little salt. And while this is going, I'm going to chop up a, a hot pepper. This is a green cayenne pepper, which uh, grows in North Carolina in the summer. And I'm not going to take the seeds out. I really like the heat that this particular pepper brings. And I cut it into four little pieces or four uh, quarters and just proceed to chop all the way down. Go ahead and add that into your aromatics. And we're going to add the rest of our ginger. And we're going to add a little pepper. At this point, we're going to go ahead and add our garlic. Let's go ahead and add a little bit more oil. And as soon as your garlic is nice and fragrant, you can add your coriander. And I'm going to boost my heat with a little cayenne pepper. You can skip that if you don't like it hot. And we're going to put in a little tomato paste. So you'll see that this is kind of a, a little mash on the side here. And the tomato paste is no longer raw. You can go ahead and combine this whole thing together. And we've got such a great fond over here. All of that is delicious flavor. We're going to deglaze that with a little white wine. Make sure you scrape up all of that caramelization and combine it with everything else. And we're just cooking the alcohol off. If you don't want to use wine, you can use a little bit of broth. Add your pureed whole tomatoes. And you want to taste this mixture to make sure that it's seasoned well. Add a little bit more salt. And we're going to cook this down until the tomatoes are not raw anymore. I'm going to combine this with our black eyed peas. These can be done in advance to this stage. Um, you can chill them. You might even be able to freeze them. And just bring them back up to a boil before you do this finishing step. And at this point, we're just going to pour all of this into our plain stewed peas. And all this needs is a few minutes to let all the flavors marry, and we are ready to serve. So while our peas are getting finished, we're going to get our garnishes ready. I really like this dish with a little chopped cilantro. You can definitely use parsley if you don't like cilantro. You can use both. Uh, we've got some green onions and a little sour cream. You can use yogurt if you prefer. And we're going to serve our black-eyed peas on this rice. I'm going to just build a plate here, just put down a little rice, and we're going to get a ladle. Put some peas right on top. And I like a little drizzle of lemon juice. And put down your cilantro, a little bit of green onion, and a little dollop of sour cream. And there you have it, Indianish Hoppin' John. Okay, so we have our completed dishes here. Um, you can uh, feel free to experiment with the uh, type of bean or pea that you use. That technique will work on pretty much any legume. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, I, I know I said to feel free to experiment, but if you, um, if you take shortcuts, you can, but don't cook your beans or peas with tomato. Uh, tomatoes are acidic, and uh, what acid does is really kind of uh, inhibits the tenderization of anything that's starchy. And, uh, you know, these do have quite a bit of starch, so make sure that you um, leave the tomato out until 
the very end, um, and that's why we kind of have this two two step process. And again, the the second part is really really quick. Um, you can garnish this with anything you want. We use sour cream here today. You can use yogurt if you want to keep it vegan. You can uh, use coconut yogurt or a little scoop of coconut cream. Um, same with the with the collards. You can garnish this with uh, some toasted shredded coconut. It would be delicious. Uh, we use cilantro and green onion. Um, but you can use parsley. And I'm sure you all have some questions. And to help us uh, get through those questions, uh, Ben is going to join us. And um, we'll talk about what you want to talk about. Oh, Chidi, just thank you very much for doing this tonight. It's just a, an entirely wonderful experience. And it's been just great to, to watch. So really appreciate you, you joining us. And I do have a whole bunch of questions right. that come in through the chat box and, and through other means. No, no whammies. No, no whammies. <laughs> um, all really, really great, great questions. And, and please, um, to those who are viewing this uh, online right now, if you have further questions, please continue to put them into the chat box and we'll follow up with Chidi and get all of your questions answered if we can't squeeze them in tonight. Uh, the first question that I have for you though is, what's your favorite thing to make? You know, you spend a lot of time in the kitchen coming up with, with dishes. What do you really enjoy? What gets you excited uh, to make? Um, I, you know, I like, I like things that are in season and I get inspired by going to the market and seeing, you know, what's fresh and pretty. And that differs from year to year. Um, and when COVID started, you know, I realized that I'd forgotten how to cook at home. Uh, you know, my, my pinch of salt was huge. Uh, I, I was like worried about, you know, my thought process really, because, you know, when you develop a recipe in, in the restaurant, it's very different than cooking for your family. But I really like comfort food. I like braising, um, you know, inexpensive cuts of meat. I like uh, making, you know, beans in the, in the Instant Pot or in the pressure cooker. Um, I like making pasta. Uh, well, I did until, you know, my gluten situation <laughs> happened. Uh, I eat a lot of rice and I like having uh, cold leftover rice because I like to make uh, quick fried rice. Um, you know, but it really is about what's in season. Uh, I tend to crave things that are growing right now. I think our body kind of knows what we want. And yeah, in the summer it's tomatoes. And right now I just want um, apples every day. Oh, wow. So one, one of the things that I noticed uh, just following you, your dishes, and, and the two that you featured tonight, the ginger and coriander uh, feature in so many of those of, of your dishes. And so we actually had a question about ingredients. What gets you, what about those ingredients gets you so excited to incorporate them into so many dishes? Well, yeah, I mean, ginger, coriander, and uh, their cousin, cumin, um, are kind of like my go-tos. Um, I feel like if I was in a desert island and I had those three, I'd be okay. Um, and I think I like them so much because uh, I think I mentioned earlier that they transform, you know, depending on how you use them. I think you'll find uh, every pickle recipe in the South kind of has whole coriander seeds. And when you put them in liquid and you're using them whole, they lend this kind of citrusy note. And it's very different when you uh, grind, the, grind, grind the seeds and they put them in hot oil and they form this uh, sort of base and they marry so well with all of these other kind of intense aromatics. And it's kind of the same thing with cumin, you know, dried, toasted, ground cumin has this smoky, nutty kind of flavor, but um, raw uh, cumin put, you know, ground and like sizzled in, in oil kind of carries heat and salt and ginger so well. And same with ginger, you know, grating it raw at the uh, end of a dish gives this like bright spiciness, but when it's uh, sauteed with aromatics, like it, it just, you know, you may not know that it's there, but you will notice if it's not there. Hmm. And it really, um, yeah, I think, you know, salt and pepper are great, but you can, you know, you can really take it so much further with those three. Right. Right. So there's just so much more versatile, no matter how you Agreed. have Agreed. And, and I think, you know, you'll find the, like, human, I, I, when Garland opened, I joke, like, you know, we were trying to find the category that we belonged yeah. in. And I was like, well, I think we're kind of the story of the migration of coriander and cumin. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't, Facebook doesn't have a category <laughs> like that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, coriander um, and cumin is used in East Asia, South Asia, you know, in the Middle East, prevalently in Latin America and South America, you know, and, and everybody kind of has a similar way of using them. I think mm -hmm. we've all simultaneously discovered the beauty of, of those spices. Well, that's, it's great. And thank you for, 
for highlighting them in, in the dishes that you talked about today. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we do a lot of here in our department, uh, it's really the intersection between family and food. And so uh, we did have a question about what about food connects you to your family? Uh, well, you know, my family has uh, been, you know, we've, we've moved a lot. My parents also, when they were kids, my mom moved from, uh, she was a part of the partition between Pakistan and India. And uh, she lost her parents in that in that move, and uh, the the food that she grew up eating was really her only connection to her family and her history. And it was a way of preserving the story of of the place where she actually grew up. And then when we moved to America again, like food was dinner was the the happiest time. It was maybe sometimes the only happy time we have. So now when I make something that my mom used to make, it, it transports me immediately. It's a, it's a connection, and I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think, you know, you would probably ask somebody in every corner of the world and say, hey, what's your favorite food, or what's your favorite dish? And they'll say, well, my grandmother's pie, or my grandmother's something, something, or the way my mom used to make this, you know. I crave it, and, you know, I can't wait to, you know, go home and see her and, and have that. And I think, you know, music and food are the only two things that we... Um, we can close our eyes and we can get transported back to a place and a time. We can remember the first time we had it or we remember how it made us feel. You can picture where you were, you know. Um, I don't think you can do that with a, a picture or painting. It's not the same. It's, it's intellectual and this is, I think, uh, something that's connected to like our being and, and who we are and how we grew up and the story of our family and the story of our life, you know. Um, I think food has that power. And it's also the time that we share with each other. Um, I think especially nowadays, everybody's, you know, always moving around. But hopefully everybody's still taking a few minutes to just be with each other, even if it's five minutes, it's usually on the dinner table or at a table with food at a restaurant or, you know, something like that. I think those connections we make over food kind of stay with us forever. It's like you said with the, the senses really triggering those memories and, and those connections. I certainly have that you know, myself. And, and it's, it, it's interesting You're, when you talk about sort of that connection with music um, and, and food, it actually leads into another question that, that we got. And you know, cooking is such a mix of science and art. You know, it's, it's those, those things together, the, the, the science of heat and, and the, the art of, of, of creativity. Can you talk a little bit about your creative process? How do you come up with I mean, how do you come up with creating a restaurant? How do you come up with s dishes? Where does that creativity come from? And, 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 and talk us through that a little bit. Well, it's, it's funny because I get asked this more now, and I never really thought of myself as a creative person. Um, I think I kind of, uh, I like to escape. And um, I think I started doing that when we moved to America. I would like just go in, my, in the room that I shared with my brother and sister, and wait for like, five minutes alone and like put my head in the speaker and just listen to music and kind of memorize the sounds, you mm. know? And um, when, when, you know, I started cooking professionally, um, I realized that like it's the creative process for writing a song or writing a recipe is kind of the same. And I feel like a lot of people go through this and you get stuck in the middle because you start out with an idea and you're like, oh yeah, this is gonna be great. And then you start working on it and it doesn't come out good. And you think, oh my God, I'm, I, I'm terrible. I don't know how to do anything, you know? And then you, and at that point, you have to plod through it. You really have to just work at it. And I think anything that's a creative endeavor always um, requires a little bit of sweat, you know? And you, uh, once you go through that process and you just really work through it, put your fear aside and your self-doubt aside, which is really difficult sometimes, but just plod through it. and you know, you kind of end up back at full circle of being really excited about an idea. And I, you know, I think when people talk about creativity, they think, oh, you know, there's a moment and the clouds part and, you know, oh, you get an idea and it's gonna be amazing. You have to work at it, you know, you really do. And I think recognizing our emotional kind of ups and downs within that process is really important to like not get bogged down with feeling bad about yourself. It's just a part of it. That's, a, that's really key, I mean, it sounds like in, in lots of things, and, and we see this in, in you know, much of the work that we do, that there's lots of failures along, along the way to make that progress in, in creativity and not to be 
not to be afraid about about this. yeah it's not a failure because you're learning from it yeah. and and it leads to where you need to be you know so it's a part of success is failure oh let's well, yeah a great perspective the, the last question that we have time to to ask you about today is is one that's it, it's it's certainly on many of our minds as, as we go through the, the this pandemic and, and we're all um you know dealing with so many challenges and and the restaurant industry is has been really decimated, you know, uh, through this pandemic. And what can we do? What can people who are viewing this today? Um, what can we do to help support the restaurant industry and, and maintain its its vibrancy, um, you know, over the upcoming months and, and years? I'm so glad you asked. Um, you know, I think we've all kind of gone through so many waves and stages uh, over the pandemic and restaurant owners have done the same thing. You know, I think we started um, back in March thinking about six weeks from now, we'll be back in business. And as the summer went on and we realized that we're not gonna be able to do that, you know, we've gone through all these processes of reinventing ourselves. Uh, the word pivot, if I never hear that again, I'll be happy. But we've all pivoted and we've, you know, we've, we've shifted how we do things so many times now. So, you know, everybody's done meal kits and like, you know, figured out how to do takeout and restaurants like ours and probably, you know, a lot of people's favorite community restaurants are dine-in restaurants and we sell an experience. We, we thrive on um, anticipating what people want when they sit down and we want them to forget the rest of their day. That's exactly the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing now. So we have this like parallel conundrum, you know, how do I keep my doors open and my staff paid? And how do I keep my staff and my guests safe? And, uh, you know, not encourage behavior that's gonna prolong this never and seemingly never ending pandemic. So, you know, if, if your favorite restaurant has pivoted to takeout, support them and order takeout, even if that's not the place that you think about getting takeout from. Um, I don't know of a single independent restaurant that's not panicking at this point mm -hmm. and nine months in, uh, just think about any business not having their normal income for nine months. It's, it's, a, it's a really trying challenge. So, you know, I've order takeout directly from them, go to their website, order the way they want you to. If they offer delivery, get it from their website. Don't go to a third party. Um, the, the commission fees can be really painful. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there are, there's a Restaurants Act in Congress and that has been passed in the House. The Senate has not passed it yet. And that would be a game changer for everybody. It would allow us to survive. Um, you know, it's not gonna be as simple as just turning our lights on and unlocking our doors when everybody gets vaccinated. It's gonna be a process and that process is expensive. And every time we have to re, you know, rethink how we're doing stuff, we have to buy things, we have to buy gloves, we have to buy outdoor furniture and heaters and takeout containers. It's all really expensive. So even when the pandemic is over, we're gonna all need some money to reopen normally and rehire our staff fully. Um, so call your, call your senators in North Carolina. One of them has supported it, the other one has not. <laughs> so um, just you know, show your voice and your concern for the restaurant industry because truly the next three months are gonna be the hardest three months we've had. Um, and one last thing is uh, there is a uh, nonprofit called the Lee Initiative and it's uh, leeinitiative.org and they have, um, they gave us a grant um, in this area to four farmers and for chefs and restaurants. Um, if you go to their site and you have the means to donate and you donate, you can, there's a drop down arrow and you click Raleigh Durham, um, Raleigh slash Durham, uh, that money goes directly back into replenishing that grant. And the way that grant works is that they give money to the farmers, um, you know, all at once. And then we can order from those farms and our invoices are sort of covered. So we're supporting the farmer's cash flow and we're supporting the restaurants. And restaurants and farmers are inextricably linked mm -hmm. uh, in this area. So it's a wonderful initiative and the more money they have, the more restaurants that they can offer that to and more farmers too. So that's a really, that's like the most direct way I've seen of helping the actual restaurants. Well, I mean, thank you for giving us such actionable tips. Um, it, it, it is you know, such a difficult, time for, for many, but, but certainly as, as we work in, in our world with 
uh, the culinary world and, and with restaurants and, and with consumers, it's, it's really, it's really um, great to hear that there are initiatives out there to, to help things uh, moving forward. And I really, I really appreciate you sharing not only your dishes with us, but, but also talking about some of the challenges that are, that are out there. I appreciate you asking about them. Well, yeah, th yeah th thank you, and, and really thank you to um, our, our audience for, for joining us today, and, and Chidi, we really uh, appreciate your stories, your passion around food, and really just being um, such a unique experience of our uh, Eloise Kofer lecture th this year, so I, I really want to thank you for your time and, and for, for being here. I'm really grateful to be here, and thank you for letting me tell my stories and cook for you. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. I will be here, maybe without a mask someday. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so for uh, our, our viewers at home, uh, you will be receiving an email with some follow-up of uh, an evaluation. And so look for that early next week. Uh, and there's an incentive uh, attached to the filling out that evaluation, some, some lovely gifts from the fabulous Garland. Um, and, and with that, uh, I, I really just want to um, on behalf of the Department of Agricultural and Human Sciences, I want to wish everyone and their families happy holidays, and thank you for joining us today.